So in this first presentation, what we do is that we uh, try to give you some concepts, some basics about the sharing of IT resources inside an organization. Uh, so we cover the main cases that are used to share resources inside IT. But first, we will start with a brief history of uh, how the computer have emerged in the last uh, decades. Uh, we'll uh, try to see how the fact that we connected computers together uh, made, uh, created a, um, a path the emergence of the utility computing model, uh, so I will cover it later. And then uh, we see how this uh, utility computing model has led to cloud computing. And right after, I will introduce uh, the um, token to AL, which we will uh, introduce uh, the sharing of the computer among the other uh, applications and several, uh, several uh, users. So I will start with the uh, path to GT computing and I will start with a brief history. So on this slide, so it's a bit blurred, but we have several images. Uh, we can see that uh, first here you have the uh, computing power of uh, the top uh, supercomputer at the given time. So it starts in the 1940 and finished in 2020. And we see that here we don't see impact, but here it's a logarithmic scale, and we see that the power of supercomputers has grown steadily in an exponential, in an exponential uh, way. Uh, but before the supercomputers, there were some uh, previous devices, and there was, for example, the computational precursors, so the calculators. So here, you can see it, but it's a logarithmic cooler. It was used for a long time to do a very quick computation of logarithmic, but that I will show some other <coughs> stuff later. Then mechanical computers, then there was the advent of electrical computers uh, with some progress, in, uh, some breakthrough in uh, electronic uh, components, and then modern computers with data centers. So we start with the present sisters uh, computers, we go in prehistoric. 
and start with calculators. So first we found some abacuses, what, which were uh, some boards with different parts and with bolts, and during uh, uh, centuries, and, uh, even more, people use it to do fast computation of, uh, of addition, division, multiplication. So it was used for uh, centuries, and then some people tried to um, use recent mathematical breakthrough to create uh, uh, some big machines that were able to do some computation. So here it's uh, a machine that is called a differential engine based on the Babbage uh, work. Mm -hmm. And what Babbage did at this time is that he saw at this time uh, mathemat mathematical tables such as logarithmic table or diverse mathematical tables were used to do, uh, were used commonly uh, to do uh, some operations, for example navigation in the sea. And the issue at this time uh, was that most of the, those tables sometimes had some errors, which could, which, which could have a very bad, uh, bad uh, consequences on some operation. And one, uh, one of the reasons was that these uh, tables were computed manually. So someone at one point uh, computed everything manually. Uh, may, may put the number inside the interpretable, and if there was a mistake, unfortunately, people will use this, uh, this, this, uh, this table and reproduce this, this mistake in the computation. And what they did is that they had an idea where it will uh, create a machine, a kind of a calculator, that will uh, do the computation. So what you have to do is that you have to uh, set up the machine, run the, the, the uh, run the machine, and then the computation will be made. And the advantage of this is that the machine will do the computation, and there will be less errors, and also you will increase the uh, precision of the results. Unfortunately, he didn't have enough uh, funds to finish his machine, so it was a bit not uh, finished, but it was one of the precursors of computers. And then, in 1936, Turing proposed a computational model, which paved the way to the future computers. And then, what people did, that they uh, took these models and created the first mechanical computers. So they were using mechanical parts to do the operations, but it was uh, Turing's, some Turing's computers. So we have the Z series in 1941, and the first Turing complete, uh, no, the Avad MK1 was in 1944, and then you had some people trying to uh, create the first Turing uh, complete uh, computers, so it was the ENAC in 1947, 46, which uh, was uh, an electronic computer, so they were using a vacuum tube to do the operation. The problem with vacuum tubes that was uh, pretty big, there were some problems with uh, also uh, with, uh, with uh, full tolerance. So what happened is that in 1947, the transistor was discovered and which paved the way to uh, more powerful computer lasers. So the, compu the, po the, the power computer continued to uh, increase uh, steadily. And uh, at this time, the model was that uh, in a uh, university, you had a large computer that was used by local, local users. Some people tried to uh, to see if it was impossible to uh, instead of having one uh, big computer per university and use this computer on, and um, make this computer usable only by a local user, maybe we could uh, uh, create a network of computers that will, and remote people will be able to use. My advantage of this, for example, was that with this, you, uh, it was not uh, mandatory to have one computer per university. It's very cool to maybe use a computing resources of another university. And also, there was also a problem with fault tolerance. If you have only one computer in university, the computer is uh, failed. Somehow, you were not able to, to use it. So some people tried to see, tried to work to, uh, to see if it was possible to connect computers. So one of the first work was the ARPANET. It was a project funded by ARPA. Uh, in 1959, uh, 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 and then some people working on computers and also on iPad uh, tried to uh, to see if um, if it was possible to create a model where you could uh, use your, com your computer uh, remotely uh, at will. Uh, so for example, John Marcati, uh, so the code is a bit blurred, but uh, was the first to propose uh, the computing resources as an utility. A utility resource is like electricity or water. For example, if uh, in this room uh, we want to turn the light, what we do is that we uh, just press the button and uh, we consume some electricity. 
In fact, there are some providers in Spain that, uh, pro that uh, produce electricity, but we don't care where are the providers. We just uh, push the button and we consume these this resources. And while the button is pressed on, we consume these this resources. We don't, uh, we don't mind uh, having to contact the producer every time we, we, we push the button. And McCarthy was the first to think of, the, of, the, of counting resources in this way. He was thinking that maybe they could add some um, a computing producer and people that would uh, like to use this, co this computing resources will be able to just uh, get some resources from this uh, producer, from this producer. In 1969, Le Leonard Kenrock, who was working on the Appalet, uh, was the first to, um, to clearly buy uh, to uh, use the world utility uh, computing. So some people at this time were, work, were imagining this uh, utility computing model where people will be able to consume some resources uh, at will and, uh, and, uh, and in this model you have users and, um, and, uh, and producers. And in 1971 there was the first exercise communication uh, between uh, two computers on a remote uh, website, so it was the achievement of Arpanet. And clearly, this, uh, this achievement was paving the way of having a network of computers interconnected in a similar way as the smart grid. So, for the smart grid, we have some power plants that are interconnected. You press the button, you get some electricity from those, uh, those, uh, those producers. So, all, uh, these people were, were, were proposing a similar uh, model for the, for the computing resources. Uh, meanwhile, uh, one evolution was that instead of, uh, until now, the model was to have bigger computers, it was doing bigger comp computation. And meanwhile, uh, some smaller computer emerged, so there was a PD, PD11, uh, so there is a picture here, so it's still big but it's uh, smaller. Uh, those computers were uh, cheaper than the big uh, mainframe. And some people also uh, would try to uh, see if it was possible to interconnect them. So there was a first work of interconnecting uh, some computers. So the idea was to interpret a smaller computer to have the same uh, power as a bigger computer. So it uh, was uh, the emergence of computer clusters and computer grids. And also some people, uh, uh, like Grace Hopper, proposed that uh, we should build a system of computers instead of having this uh, big, uh, these, these big computers. It was paving the way to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, the cluster of uh, computer. So there is a quote here from Greg Super, which we say that in Python days, so a long time ago, uh, when people uh, were uh, uh, pulling uh, some heavy ox, so there so, some heavy piece of wood, uh, if, for example, a beef was not enough to pull, uh, to pull a very big piece of wood, instead of making the, the beef very big, it would have more power. It was better to use two or three uh, beef to push it. So she was the first, one of the first to propose this, uh, this notion of system of computers. And this notion of system of computers has become very popular because it's somehow the, what we use today. So then, uh, after the emergence of uh, small computers, there was also the emergence of uh, desktop computers. So the computers that we have now, they emerged in, uh, they become very popular in the 80s. And it paves the way to the desktop grids, for example, in the 90s, and also to the BO <coughs> cluster. So, what is a BO web cluster? It's this cluster here. It's a cluster composed of community uh, computers. So, it's a computer that you can uh, buy, uh, for example, with, uh, uh, with uh, community uh, components, such as, for example, classical uh, uh, processors, such as one that you have, can buy online. And uh, instead of using this very uh, expensive computer, we use this uh, a, a large set of uh, small uh, computers that are cheap and we interconnect them. So it was very popular in the 90s and, uh, and 80s. And also, uh, one evolution is that uh, virtualization, uh, which is the topic of this uh, course, uh, despite it has been invented in the 1960s, uh, as the computers become uh, more uh, cheaper and more powerful, uh, this utilization uh, became popular again in the late uh, 90s. And the this uh, emergence of uh, computer clusters, uh, virtualization, uh, paves the way to the cloud computing in 2000s. Yes. So. Uh, yeah, so Jonathan uh, told you a bit about the history of resources, uh, which is one 
of uh, the enabling technologies that lead to cloud computing, but the other one is the evolution of the operating system. So right now I'm going to introduce you a bit about uh, operating systems. So of course you know all that a computer is a set of hardware resources and a set of software resources. And uh, in the 50s and the 60s, there were no hardware abstraction between uh, the hardware and the software. So you were coding actually programs what, that were run directly on the bar itself, on the machine itself, on the electronic machine. And uh, this is still true, uh, for instance, in video games, consoles or embedded systems. But uh, of course, it's easier to have an abstraction model in between, so this is the, the goal of the operating system, to have an abstraction layer in between the hardware and the software. And so the idea is to hide the complexity of the hardware to the user. Uh, also to have a kind of uh, genericity, so you're using the same operating system if you have uh, an AMD 64 or an Intel processor. Uh, but you also have some specific operating systems sometimes which are more optimized for your specific hardware, but you can have a generic one. Um, and the main topic in operating systems is to share resources. So you have to share resources between users, between tasks, between uh, nodes, etc. So I will explain all that uh, in this uh, slide. So there are many scientific challenges behind operating systems. You have concurrency, parallelism, you have task scheduling, I/O management. You have many, many kinds of uh, scientific challenges. And what is clear is that you, are, you have a close linkage between the resource complexity and the operating system complexity. Uh, the more complex is are your resources, for instance, if you have a supercomputer, it's much more difficult to operate than having a single node uh, machine. So you have a kind of um, linkage between those two different parts and they evolve simultaneously. Sometimes the evolution is uh, led by the need in the software and in system and sometimes the evolution comes from resources. Okay, so there are many kinds of operating systems in the history. So, uh, for instance, in uh, 1980, there were some single tasking operating systems that disappeared uh, very fast. <laughs> but it was the case with Apple Macintosh and MS-DOS that were able to run only one task at a time. Uh, but in 1970, so earlier, we were already able to do multitasking operating system with Unix. And so the idea when you have a multitasking operating system is that you share resources between tasks. So you have to handle which task is going to use the memory at this time, so it's a kind of scheduling problem. Okay. Um, then you have single versus multi-user operating systems. Um, so, for, for instance, Windows uh, 95, NT, MS-DOS, and uh, mobile operating systems are operating systems for a single user at a time. And, uh, of course, you have also multi-user operating systems. Uh, um, so, the idea here is to share the resources between users in addition to between tasks. Um, and so, I would say that any operating system with the SSH server to be considered as a multi-user operating system, but you also have some specific operating systems that have been uh, designed in order to address multi-user uh, complexity. So this is the case, for instance, of Unix Linux, uh, recent Windows or Windows servers, Mac OS servers or recent Mac OS uh, systems, etc. And of course, we will explain that uh, later, but in uh, the cloud computing, you have also operating systems, which are, of course, multi-user operating systems. Um, another kind of operating system is, uh, are we able to operate multiple nodes or a single node? Uh, so, all operating systems on our, on our laptop are single node operating systems. 
And if you consider a multi node cluster, so this is a picture of a Barcelona supercomputing, which is very nice. I like this picture. <laughs> uh, the idea when you have multiple nodes is that you have to share the resources, but not only the resources of a single computer, but of many of them. Um, and so the idea is that you will have multiple tasks, multiple users, and multiple nodes, and you have to handle all this in the operating system, which of course is very complex. Um, and there were many different kinds of initiatives to handle this problem. So, for instance, the single system image, uh, the idea is to have an abstraction such that the multi-node computer is seen as a single node. So you have, I don't know, uh, uh, 20 nodes maybe, each one with two cores, but what you see is one node with uh, two uh, times uh, 20 cores. So the idea is to have an abstraction uh, for the user such that uh, the user can use the multi-node computer as a single node computer. Also in a supercomputer um, like this one, um, what happens is that each compute node has a kind of a micro kernel, which is a very small operating system. And you have a, a server which is responsible for the entry point point for the user, and as a user you are going to request some resources to a batch schedule, which is a very low level way of asking for resources. In the cloud, it's almost the same, but you have this kind of virtualization of the resources in addition, and you will have more user-friendly APIs. And all this is directly related to uh, the idea of ha having a modular, a modular and distributed operating systems. Um, you can see here that the, the distributed system, uh, sorry, the operating system is actually distributed because you have some parts of the operating system that are uh, distributed among nodes and some parts of the operating system that are centralized inside the entry point. So it's directly related to the distributed aspects of the operating system. Um, so the idea when you talk about a distributed operating system is that you will have different modules responsible for different subparts of the operating system. And so there were many academic initiatives around the 90s and 2000. Um, in 2005, there were the microkernels uh, initiatives with Minix 3, for instance. And recently, uh, researchers um, talk a lot about disaggregation of computers, which is a way to see a computer as a, a set of resources that could be not uh, merged inside a single node, that you can have memory, I don't know, in Madrid, uh, CPUs in Barcelona, etc. And so, in disaggregation, uh, you also need to have some kind of distribution of the operating system. And finally, the cloud operating systems are most of the time modular and distributed operating systems. Okay, so I'll show you a bit the evolution of the operating systems. What happened is that this evolution progressively led to the virtualization. Uh, because with virtualization, and we will talk a bit more about this realization just after. With virtualization, you have an easy way to handle multiple operating systems at the same time. You can have Windows, Mac OS, Linux on the same machine, running in different virtual machines, for instance. You also have an easier way to handle multi-user, because you have a better resolution with the virtual machines, for instance, and you have more security, more memory isolation, etc. And also with the virtualization, you have an easier way to handle multi-node uh, uh, machines uh, as you are able to dynamically migrate the virtual machine on another node. So for all these reasons, actually, <coughs> the operating system evolution has progressively led to the virtualization. So, the overview of this first part is that <coughs> we've shown you the evolution 
of the resources uh, that led to uh, the concept of utility computing, also the cluster of nodes and the interconnection of different uh, sites. And we have shown you the evolution of the operating system uh, to the virtualization. And actually the cloud computing is all that together. So it's the virtualization of the, of the resources, the cluster, the inter-site communication, and the concepts of utility computing. So now we are going to talk uh, a bit more about virtualization. First of all, maybe you have some questions about this first part. Yeah. Could you could you go back please to the slide with the hamburger? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You have a question about the hamburger? I just want to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <Anna. laughs> yes? I uh, really get well the difference between uh, supercomputers and the crowd OS. How the Technically, yeah. how they work, and uh, can you? Yes. So uh, we're actually going to explain that uh, in the third part of the course. Yeah. Maybe if later we didn't answer uh, clearly enough to your mm -hmm. question, we can yeah. discuss again.
So there is different kinds of virtualization. So uh, the main way is to do uh, hypervisor-based virtualization, where you have an hypervisor that will decide uh, on which guest I will uh, provide some resources. So it will uh, organize the virtualization of the host. We have, we have also uh, some uh, other kind of virtualization, which is kind of level virtualization, which is close to the hypervisor one, but it will uh, use the physical host operating systems to um, partly to distribute the resources. And then this one is in Italic, it's a shared kernel virtualization, it's a uh, light container that we will see it later with the uh, So as I like to do a brief uh, history point on the side, so I will do a brief history of virtualization so we will understand uh, which path has been used to uh, go from uh, uh, the big computers and then to cloud computing. Uh, so, virtualization starts in the 60s, so there was an IBM project, this was a research project called M4044X, and the idea was to divide uh, a computer like this, so it's uh, an IBM uh, 7040, so they use a 44, but I couldn't find a picture of the 44, so I put a picture of the 40. But it was a computer like this, and the idea of this project was to uh, give the impression that instead of having one uh, big computer, you had several smaller computers. Uh, what is interesting here is that they were the first ones to use the virtual machines in the world, so it's uh, quite interesting for history. But however, it was not a, a full emulation of the underlying hardware. So there was a later project in 1964, which was the IBM CP40 project, and what they used is they tried to go from a time sharing system to a virtualized system. So they had some uh, weird virtualization here. So it, this project paved the ground for the CP67 uh, project in 1967, uh, which was a research project with uh, real uh, virtual machines. Uh, in 1932, uh, IBM uh, released the first production, uh, first commercial operating system that was, that was enabling uh, customers to have a virtual machine, so it was the first uh, production with, uh, proof operating system uh, that provide, provide uh, virtual machines, but it was not uh, really uh, used, so uh, it was, um, people forgot about uh, virtualization, it was not used for a real system, it was used for a very specific uh, uh, system, and the virtualization became popular again at the end of the 90s, when the desktop computer became powerful enough to run some, uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, resource hungry uh, virtualization software, and then when there is, there is VMware uh, Power Station 1.0 in 1999, uh, it was enabling people to have several uh, windows running inside the windows. So it was useful for the point if you wanted to test your software on Windows 95 when Windows 95 was, uh, was, was not uh, uh, released a a anymore. So it was, and somehow people, uh, uh, the interest for visualization. Uh, rose again at, at this time. And at the beginning of 2000s, people tried, tried to see if it was possible to improve virtualization, to not only really, uh, virtualize some uh, workstation to test for software, but also to be able to have uh, real virtual servers. So it was a main project uh, in 2003, I guess. And also they were to continue their work on virtualization to virtual servers. And this virtualization of servers paved the way to the Model. So it was uh, the first step in the infrastructure uh, service uh, layer of computing that I will uh, dig into details uh, later. Uh, so I will come back now after a brief story, I will come back to what is a virtual machine. So what is a virtual machine? It's a large typical computer. It's a, it's a virtual computer that will have one of several virtual CPUs that will work on the same principles as a physical uh, CPUs. Virtual, as a, Typical computer a virtual machine will also have an allocation of memory. So uh, it will, uh, the physical host will decide how much memory the physical the virtual machine will have, but we can uh, allocate some, uh, some memory that the virtual machine can do. Uh, also, you can have some virtual disk, so it's a virtual uh, hard drive, and you can allocate those uh, hard drives to the virtual machines. And also, you can allocate one of several uh, virtual interfaces to the virtual machine. So the virtual machine is really like a uh, physical uh, machine, except that it's running on uh, its uh, software and running on a physical host. 
Also, uh, you will create uh, a virtual machine based on, a, on an image. So what you will do is that you will create an image based on a, on a, on a, on a operating system such as, for example, uh, Linux, Debian, or Windows. And uh, when you create a virtual machine, you specify uh, a base image that will be used to uh, start the virtual machine. And also, you have some, uh, some, some specific operations that you can do uh, on the virtual machine that you can not do on the uh, or which are very hard to do on physical uh, um, host, such as, for example, stopping your uh, your uh, system and running, uh, to stopping the execution of the virtual machine and, uh, and uh, resuming the execution of the virtual machine. You can do it with a physical host. Uh, also, snapshots in virtual machine, you can do it. So it means that you will uh, take a picture of virtual machines and later we will be able to restore the virtual machine from this. It's very hard to do it with your uh, netbook. And also, you have some oper some very uh, interesting operations of, uh, such as uh, net migration, where if you have two uh, physical hosts running virtual machines, you can migrate uh, the live operation, one uh, virtual machine from one host to the other host without uh, any uh, interruption of uh, services on the inside of the game. This is something that you cannot do, or which are very hard to do with a physical host. Uh, so now I will cover how does, how does the virtual machine uh, work. Uh, first, you have to know that on modern CPUs, uh, you have uh, some um, uh, say, privileged uh, levels uh, for your processor. So typically, it's uh, depicted in the form of frames. So you have uh, several level of frames, and this level of frames uh, represents some, uh, execution, some execution privilege level. For example. Uh, on the X40, X86 uh, uh, CPUs, so we'll have four levels of uh, execution privilege. So it will go first from 0 to 3, and 0 is the um, uh, biggest privilege uh, uh, level, so it means that uh, you can uh, do uh, some, uh, uh, some, you can execute in this uh, level some uh, um, privilege uh, instruction, while the level uh, 3 is uh, level with the least privilege, uh, level of privilege. So typically when you run an operating system such as Linux, the kernel will run inside the level zero of the of the of the inside the level zero so that it has access to, to the, some privilege instructions such as um, manipulating the memory or manipulating some devices while the user land uh, will uh, run inside the level three of uh, this this uh, 86 uh, CPU, which means that it's uh, <coughs> almost no uh, execution privilege. So, as uh, on the, on the uh, modern operating system, the kernel will run inside the level 0 and the user vision will run inside the level 3, the art of visualization is to uh, enable the guest operating system, so the operating system running inside the VM, to have the impression to run inside. Uh, to run with a big, uh, to with a big level of privilege. So there are different techniques that enable uh, to uh, give some impression to the guest operating system to run with a high level of, uh, of privilege. And I don't think I will, uh, I will uh, show uh, this, uh, these techniques here because it's uh, uh, So now I will uh, I'll give some examples of hypervisors that, are, that you can find when you do visualization. Uh, so we we uh, differentiate the hypervisors with uh, two categories. So the first one is a native hypervisors, and the second one is hosted hypervisors. So what are the difference? In fact, is that the native hypervisors they run directly on the on top of the hardware. So we have two kind, two, two way. You can have uh, you can design a software that will run directly on top of the hardware. So for example, in the case of uh, of uh, Xen or uh, Hyper-V or ESXC or KVM, but also there is a, a, a variant inside this category that you can also run a Linux and uh, have, it, have some part of the hypervisor running in the kernel space of, uh, of the Linux, in the case of, uh, of KVM. The second uh, type of hypervisors, uh, in fact, they run, it's a dedicated software that runs inside uh, an operating system. Uh, so in the case of uh, QMU, uh, VMware Workstation, that is ESXC, and also VirtualBox. Uh, so I put uh, here a diagram showing the difference between uh, Xen, KVM, and QMU. And you see that Xen is a software that runs on top of uh, the hardware. 
Uh, what does it then? That it creates a virtual machine which is called the DOM uh, POW that will be the interface between the users and the hyper users. So in, when you want to create a VM, for example, what you do is that you connect directly inside this uh, VM here. And this VM will send some instruction to the API users that will uh, then execute uh, some action, such as creating VMs or creating a uh, distributed VM. With KVM, it's a bit different. You have uh, an, oper an operating system, such as Linux, running on top of, uh, an, so of the hardware. And inside uh, uh, the Linux, you have some modification uh, that is made. So it's a uh, kernel module uh, running here that will uh, manage all the virtual machines that you create here. And uh, for QEMU, which, uh, which has the same model as VirtualBox, you have a, a complete uh, operating system running on top of the hardware, and here we have a software that will uh, manage, run, manage uh, all the virtual machines. Uh, I will do a demo of a virtual machine to, to illustrate what uh, I did. So now what I will do is that I will stop the presentation and I will launch, uh, I will show some virtualization with a uh, virtual box. So I'm running virtual box right now. I will run. So if you see here, I'm uh, on macOS, so it's, uh, it's an operating system made by Apple, so it's not Linux. And what, what I will do now is that I will, with VirtualBox, launch uh, virtual machines uh, that will uh, contain uh, the Linux. So what you see is uh, a screen uh, appears here. You have a purple screen, which is a launch screen of, uh, of, uh, of Linux. And what you, what you see here is that it's somehow like if I had a computer screen inside my, uh, my, my computer. So if you see, you have, you have a Daniel prompt that will uh, start soon. You see that Ubuntu is running. And Ubuntu is running inside macOS. How is it possible? It's because, in fact, between macOS and the Ubuntu, you have uh, this virtual box uh, glue that will uh, virtualize, create a virtual computer, and give the impression to Ubuntu that it's running on a real computer. So here, the Ubuntu is starting, like, he, like, like, he, like if it was a, a typical computer. It will uh, do some stuff on the memory, on the, on the, on the processor, and uh, virtual box will handle all those aspects. So with this, I can uh, run two operating systems at the same time on my, on my computer. I have my main operating system, macOS. I also have uh, Ubuntu. I could also run several, uh, several virtual machines at the same time. So I could uh, run maybe uh, 10 uh, uh, Ubuntu at the same time. So I could also run Windows if I want. So I will see if I can uh, show the, the stuff so to convince you that it's a real computer running inside a uh, real virtual computer running inside a So you see, uh, we have a desktop. Uh, I can enjoy it with this, it's not fake. So it's a uh, virtualization. Is it clear for everyone this? So now I have to tell this is a bit versus three. And we'll go back to the presentation. Alright. So I think that now I will do the token, which we will talk with a lot of containers. Yeah. Okay. Um, so do not hesitate to interrupt. There is something not quite clear, okay? So <clears throat> this is the usual uh, basic picture when you talk about containers. So as Jonathan explained, uh, well, it's not really here. No. <laughs> so uh, in virtual machines, you have different kind of uh, way of having some hypervisors on your operating system. You may have uh, a host operating system, then an hypervisor, and then some guest operating systems. Or you may have, like in XEN, the, uh, the hardware, the hypervisor on top of it, and then some guest operating systems. Okay. And the idea of a container is that uh, you are actually sharing a part of the host operating systems between the different containers. So you have a, a, a part of the operating system that is shared between the containers, which is not the case in the virtual machine because you have one guest operating system per virtual machine. In the container, the basic idea is that you share a subpart of, the, of the, the operating systems between the containers. It seems like a multi-user uh, operating system. Yeah, true. It's uh, containers could be considered as a multi-user operating system. 
Um, so this is uh, system vision. So it's not real again. Yeah. But mm -hmm. actually what happens is that um, an operating system is divided into different parts. So the, the, the part uh, responsible for the basic blocks of your operating system is called the kernel. Uh, the kernel is the first thing that runs on your computer at when you start it. It's the basic building blocks responsible for uh, the operating system uh, to work properly. And on top of the lin of kernel, Linux or whatever, you have um, the root uh, file system, which is more related to the applications level. Um, when you're doing when you are uh, running some virtual machines, you will have actually uh, a guest uh, uh, host operating system with a kernel and a root file system. On top of it, you will have the hypervisor that is considered as an application on your host operating system. And then you will have a virtualization layer of the hardware, and then again a kernel, and then again a root file system. When you're using containers, the idea, the idea is that you share the kernel or the host system between all the containers. So you will have the kernel, then the root file system. On the root file system, you will have the container daemons, uh, like an hypervisor, it's like an hypervisor, but a smaller one. And each container will actually create a new root file system for each container. So you will have the kernel that is the same for all the containers, but one root file system for each container. So this way, the applications uh, embedded in each container will have its own memory space, but sharing the same kernel, the same building blocks of your operating system. Okay. So <coughs> how is this possible? So. In 2002, uh, there was an important evolution in the Linux kernel, which was the namespace isolation. So the idea is that you are able to isolate, so to partition the memory allocation of the processes, such that one process is not able to access the memory allocation of another. And in 2007, uh, appeared the control groups, which was developed by Google in the Linux kernel. And the idea of the control groups is to partition the resources of your computer between the processes. And by using those two new features in the kernel, um, people were able to create the Linux containers, which was the first, uh, the first initiatives regarding containers. So it was in 2008. And so it combines the namespace and the, the control groups in order to isolate a subset of your processes and to give some resources to a subset of your processes. And in 2013, uh, Docker appeared, so maybe you heard about Docker, mm -hmm. because it's well known. Mm -hmm. uh, initially, Docker was an evolution of the Linux containers. Nowadays, uh, Docker runs its own <coughs> container technology, but uh, at the beginning, it was an evolution of the Linux container. And the idea uh, initially was to have an abstraction layer in order to create containers only to package some applications. This was the basic idea. So with, with Linux containers, it's more like uh, an operating system. You create an operating system, even if the kernel is shared between the containers, you create a new operating system. And the operating system is going to live during uh, its evolution, while a Docker container is more a uh, packaging of an application inside a container. This was the initial philosophy. So, of course, there are many other solutions to run containers. Uh, you have CoreOS, uh, Rocket, Francie, Singularity, which is more specific to high performance computing. Uh, but I will not give too much details about this. Okay? I have a question. Yeah, sure. Sure. Uh, in your picture, how does BSD and JOS relate to this? Sorry? Uh, JOS, the system that was in BSD, <coughs> yes. Linux, how it relates 
to to be uh, to dark I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you have a clue about this. No, I, I just know that it was the uh, a kind of Docker for BSD, developer for BSD. Yeah. But uh, that happened a few years before. And I, I don't know the real difference. I think it was limited. Uh, and, but I, 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 I thought it was. Good question. Excuse me. Uh, what was the requirement of having application package by Docker? So the main purpose is portability. So by having a, an application package into a container, you can move your container in another uh, machine, and it will work. So, I mean, the containers. It, uh, the name is because it contains everything to run the application properly. So actually, you are. Do not have to care about uh, well. I need a Python uh, 2.6 in order to have my application working. It's embedded into the containers, so you have a much more portable application. So it's a new kind of packaging approach. You can also package uh, applications in other ways. So for instance, uh, Maven is a way to to package some Java applications. Uh, containers in, is another one. Uh, yeah. And so you have a, this is actually the subject of my next slide, so you have advantages and disadvantages of using containers. The advantages uh, is that you have a light virtualization mechanism because you do not have to embed a new operating system uh, inside the container. You just embed the root file system, which is a, a very small part of it. Um, so the result is that you almost have no overheads compared to virtual machines. You have a faster startup time, um, you have an easy way to package your applications, and so it increases the portability of the applications, but it also simplifies uh, the life of system administrators, because when, you're, when you have to handle a um, huge uh, cluster with many users, as you said before, containers could be considered as a multi-user operating system because if you have to manage many users, each of them having its own requirements, I need Python 2.6, I need Python 2.5, I need that. Uh, it's very difficult to handle this kind of uh, infrastructure. And by using containers, well, you embed what is needed by the application inside the container and you can run many containers at the same time on your infrastructure. So you do not have uh, requirements, uh, conflicts. Uh, oh, sorry. So the cons. Um, so um, the disadvantages of using containers compared to virtual machines is that live migration is more difficult because you're sharing a part of the operating, of the operating system. So if you want to migrate a container, you will have to get exactly the same state of the kernel part of your operating system in another node, which is of course much more difficult than just moving the entire operating system to another node. Um, so there are many researchers thinking about this, how to uh, make uh, easy live migration by using containers. Um, then, of course, as you are sharing the kernel, you will not be able to run a Windows and a Mac OS on the same node, because it's not the same kernel. Mm -hmm. So, basically, uh, by using uh, containers, you have to handle as many containers as you want, but on a single operating system. Um, then it's also more difficult to handle uh, security and isolation uh, between the containers for the same reason, because you have this kernel layer which is shared between all the containers, you have some security leaks. For instance, uh, if you have a leak from your container, your root, then you can access the kernel and then you can do things on other containers. Uh, so it's much more difficult to isolate compared to virtual machines where you really have one OS for one user, that's it. You cannot access your own OS. Okay. 
Okay. Yes. <coughs> So portability is more related to the requirements, uh, the libraries that you need uh, to run your your application. Um, so migration is really um, my computer is a, is in a given state. So for instance, uh, uh, in memory I have uh, this variable, this variable, this variable. Uh, it's really low level problems. It's uh, what is the state of my computer, and if I stop it, am I able to rerun it in another place? So it's really I have a state, I have to stop it, and I have to restart it somewhere else. Portability is another problem. It's more uh, to run my application. I need uh, Python. I need Java. I need Right migration, you mean moving container, breaking container from one machine to other machine? Exactly. Uh, what about maybe I'm wrong, getting it wrong? So, for example, we created a Docker for an application and we put in a Docker Hub so uh, we grant access to users and they are able to download it. So, isn't it easy migration or you mean something else? No. Migration is dynamic, so you are running an application and you move it while it's running. And you can't see the migration. So it's not, I have an image, I started somewhere, and I started in another place. It's, I started somewhere, and while it's running, I migrate it to another node. And when you, when you want to optimize the usage of a multi-node infrastructure, is the kind of thing you would like to do. Because maybe at some point, uh, you have a, um, you have a, so this is a node, okay, node one, node two, and I have a, a VM one here, a VM two here, I have a VM three, and this has, let's say it's full, so the CPU is used 100%, so I will not have the VM three ends, okay. and then VM three ends, because the service is Okay, it's finished. I have space in node one. If I'm able to move VM2 to node one, I will shut down node two and I will make some. Uh, yeah. So this is why uh, live migration is very interesting for infrastructure. Uh, when you provide an infrastructure, so that you can optimize your costs and your. Uh, yeah, um, one thing. Yeah. You even mentioned that you said they're running on one operating system, like all applications. So how is the disadvantage? How is it disadvantage? Why is it con? Because container virtualization means that we wanna use one system and we wanna do multiple containers or virtual machines. But why is it disadvantage that if all are running on one operating system? Okay. So um, when you provide an infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, you may have some users that need Windows and some that need Linux. So with containers, you're not able to. Basically, you will see that we will be able, but basically by using containers, you will have only, for instance, Linux. You cannot have Windows because the kernel of Windows and Linux uh, are not mm -hmm. the same. Okay. Okay. So I will talk a bit more about two different uh, technologies of containers. So one is the Linux containers I talked about before, yeah. and um, the one is Docker. And the philosophy of these two uh, containerized technologies are very different. One is a bed, a nice small uh, dog. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the idea is that uh, this is your container, okay? It's beautiful, you want to keep it, you want to give it a name, and you want it to live for a very long time, okay? And another one, which is the Docker vision, is, well, a container is just a cattle. You have many of them, uh, you consume them, and then you discard them. This is the philosophy of Docker, okay? Mm -hmm. 
So, <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a five to this kind of work. Actually, yeah, I really like it. But good example, of course. So, um, the idea with the pet is more to scale up, to make it evolve through time, and uh, you see it's uh, almost like a virtual machine. It's an operating system that you, you want to keep. Okay. While in Docker, it's much more a scale-out. So you have applications, you have services, and you package them into, into containers, and then you launch them, you consume the container, and when the application ends, the container ends. And you have many of them. So it's two kinds of containers uh, with a different philosophy. Even if with Alexei, you can do the cattle, and with Docker you can do the pet. But um, initially, it was two different visions of the, the continuous. So, LXA, the pet, uh, we often say it's an operating system model. So the idea is that you get something that looks like a virtual machine. You have an operating system. You connect. Uh, on it, you will install packages, uh, create new files, etc. Then, when you quit your, quit your container, you can come back and make it all again, etc. Okay? Uh, yeah. And in Docker, uh, one container is uh, an application package. Uh, you run it. The application runs, and then, then the application ends, and the container ends. Okay. Um, so, as I told you initially, Docker uh, was built on top of LXE. Uh, nowadays, we have our own container technology. I think it's not open source, so, but maybe you can check that. I'm not sure about this. But anyway, it's written in a Go language, Docker. And you have a very complex ecosystem around Docker, because you have the Docker Hub, it's where you pull your images. Uh, you have uh, the Docker desktop, and then you have many different orchestration tools. I will come back to that later, but uh, it's a really complex ecosystem. While LXC is more light, it's Linux embedded. Um, and yeah, uh, I told you before that. With uh, LXC, you can actually perform a Docker vision, and this is mainly due to LXD evolution of LXC. But this is details. Uh, I think it's not that interesting. Um, okay, one in interesting thing is that um, the way you build uh, container images in both worlds are very different. So in the pet world. Uh, <coughs> Uh, it's like a virtual machine. You will create uh, an image that embeds the packages you need, the libraries you need. Uh, uh, you can connect on the container and then install new things and create a new image, etc. etc. You, you can also have some persistent data into your container. Okay. So it's really like a machine, an operating system. In Docker, when you build an image, it's a layer-based image. So, what well, actually, it's very smart. So, you will say, okay, I, I base my new image on Ubuntu, for, ex for instance, and I will add a layer for Python and add a layer for Java because I need Java and etc. etc. And you build a new image by layering all these requirements. And if at some point you need uh, you do not need any more uh, Python 2.7, but uh, Python 2.6. You will not have to rebuild the entire image, but only to rebuild the layers after Python. So it's a more flexible way of seeing uh, container images. Uh, also, one different aspect is that <coughs> in uh, Docker, um, you're not supposed to embed persistent data in your container. You will have the data volumes that you attach to your containers, which is a big difference from LXC, where you really have 
uh, you can add a persistent data, you can create files in, in your container. It's not the philosophy of Docker, uh, where you, you should create volumes and attach them to the containers. Okay? So, let's do a demo. So, um, the demo uh, will be accessible in the website of the practical session if you want to review it. Okay. So, <coughs> so I'm on a Mac OS, so I do not have Linux container. I could have, but... Uh, so I'm using the try online uh, of uh, Linux containers. Okay. So here... Okay. So now I have a Linux. Great. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> um, can you see it? Yes. Okay. So, um, okay. So in LXC, first you can list um, the images that you have on your Linux. Okay. okay. No surprise. Uh, if you do LXC list, you will have a list of containers. I have no containers. Okay. Um, okay, so I need some backup documents. So what I will do is that I will create an image uh, based on Ubuntu. Okay. So the command is LXC launch. Mm. Sorry, I don't do my Images, uh, I'm going to... And I will take this version of Ubuntu. Okay. Uh, and the name of, it, of my container uh, is going to be first. That's why. So if first. you directly mm -hmm. download from internet, right? The yes. version you're writing here. Exactly. So the Ubuntu will be pulled from the internet. Mm -hmm. This is a basic uh, image of the yeah. Ubuntu. Okay. And it will create a new container by using this image. And I call this container first. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I will do that uh, just after. 
Okay. So right now I'm just saying the container executes something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, <coughs> for instance, I, I will say to the container, well, execute uh, SL, which is the package I, I've just installed. Okay. And this is SL. Mm -hmm. Great. So it's working. You are able to run something on your container. Okay. And then what I can do is that I can say, okay, execute a batch on my container. And now, you can see I'm connected to first. Mm -hmm. So right now I'm having a batch on my container. Okay. So if I run directly SL, it works. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is it clear? Okay. Yeah. So now to show you the persistent data, um, I can create, uh, for instance, uh, a directory, and I will create a file in my directory. Okay, and now in my directory I have a file. Okay, I will exit the dash, mm -hmm. and just to check that the data are still in my container, I can, for instance, do uh, ls test and I will see my file. So everything is working uh, properly and uh, you see it's like a bit like a virtual machine. You access your container, you execute some commands on it, you change it, you add new packages, <coughs> etc. Um, of course you can also, I, I will not do that right now, but you can also create a new image from this new container that I modified. Okay. And so what I can do uh, also is, is to broke my container. <laughs> uh, no, before broken it, I will snapshot it. <laughs> so, um, how does it work? I think it's this. So I will snapshot my container first and I will call my snapshot save. Like some of them. Okay. Uh, okay. 
So this was the LC demo, so the pet, the same the pet, right? You want to give it a name, you want to have interaction with it. Um, so I need the term for the pet. using 
the, the image demo Ubuntu, and I want to launch the program SL in it. Okay? Um, if I take a look at the list of containers, we should have came the yes, sure. before. <laughs> Um, so here you can see uh, a container that is based on demo Ubuntu. I've launched SL on it and it's exited. Okay? And uh, Docker gave it a name which was Stoic Ishiza. It was the name that Docker gave to my container. But my container is not running anymore because SL is ended. So you see, it's really a way to package an app and to run it inside a container. This is the philosophy behind it. Okay. But of course, I can oh, I, I can check. Um, so for instance, I will uh, I will. I will Okay, I will do something like that. Okay. So <clears throat> here I've created a container by using demo Ubuntu and I ask for a batch. And so I have a batch on my container. Okay. Um, and I will install Python. Now I should have Python, okay? And I will, uh, like before, create a directory and create a file in my new directory. I will create two files. Okay, and I exit my container. Now in the list of containers. <laughs> Uh, I have another one, which is also based on Kimo Ubuntu. I launched a bash on it, and it's mm -hmm. exhibit. And you see that I created two different containers by running two different commands from the image. Okay. And if, of course, I do this again, mm -hmm. I should not have. Python installed because I'm running another new container which is totally different from the previous one. Yeah, so I do not have Python and I do not do not have any test directory. Okay. Okay. But what I can do uh, is restarting a container. I will restart uh, the one I will restart this one. This is the one where I've installed Python and created the file. Okay. And I will attach it so I can connect to it. And now I'm back in the container I've created before. Okay? And I have Python installed. So it's just to illustrate that if you want, you can actually use your container as an LXC. So you can restart it, connect to it again, and modify it, etc. But this is not the philosophy 
So the last thing I wanted to show is the volume measure concept. So, um, so maybe I will do some clean. Yeah. Uh, so you can see there is already a volume. And if 
if I do not give any command, uh, the, the behavior of the pairs will give you a connection to the container. So, okay, I'm directly connected in the container. So, just to check, okay, I have Python installed, which is fine. And also, I have volume data. But now you are logging into the Docker app, right? Yeah, I'm so inside the container. You, uh, the volume you created now should be accessible from host machine as well. Yes. Can we see from host machine? This was the purpose uh, of. I will check. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure actually. Uh, you can see it in the list of volumes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You can attach a volume that is uh, on your host system. Uh, this is not what I've done here. Oh, okay. I've created an empty volume, which is data, that does not exist on my host okay. operating okay. system. But it will create anyway a new volume, yeah. and then I will be able to attach it to all the containers. Okay, Thank you. So let's just create a file in data. And okay. So now you can see I have a second volume that is being created. Uh, and I can uh, inspect uh, the container just to show you that I have a volume that is mounted on the container. Mm -hmm. This is the name of the volume, and so it should be this one here. Okay. Um, okay, so now um, I can remove uh, my container, C1, okay, that I just created, but I still have my volume. And now if I create again a new container, uh, I don't Thank you. 
tricky part of the uh, We will do the break, but think during the break. How is it possible that I run a Linux container on MacBooks? It's impossible by a combination of VM and container. I do have a couple of questions before the break. Before the break, how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can ask one right now and uh, okay, okay. later. So first, uh, so I think, can, can you create containers inside? Like, uh, yeah. Yes, okay. actually, when I uh, remember when I don't the user you know, on LXC, uh, as I'm on a macOS, uh, I went through the trial line of LXC, and actually what I got is a container. Then I created containers inside containers. And you can, can you create a um, Docker container inside the uh, LXC container? Um, mm -hmm. Maybe I can ask another question. <laughs> so when, when did you get the image for the... When you were uh, in your Docker file, you say from Ubuntu last test. So where, where does it get the... Uh, from, from Docker. So it's from... So can I ask the last question? This case is a bit difficult. Do you know how the IP address are given to the containers? Uh, I think it's using the same uh, network than your uh, host So if you're connected to a DHCP server, it's Because I know that it depends on the OS you are using. Uh, that my OS is not giving, uh, not giving the, the, the IP address in the same way that uh, any uh, yeah, Depending on the application. Actually, your Mac doesn't do anything most of the time when you have an IP address. No, I mean, the, your, your company has an IP address, uh, which is a, would be a, a, a local address. Uh, uh, and then, depending on the OS you use, it doesn't give the same address. So if you are using uh, Linux or Mac OS, the IP address of the, your company won't be the same. And I just don't know why. Yeah, it depends on your network configuration. Uh, I don't know if it, is it a local address that is given by the time we Yes, it's a local address. I'm sure about that, but I just want to look at it. Uh, what you do here, we show uh, how to run the part of the data. But then we can also show you how so here we show how to run one container, so it's use Docker, but then you have different, uh, some other things such as Docker Compose, which enable to have a different con a container to work together. And I think in the Docker Compose you can specify uh, how the network stack of the container will be able to sometimes. I think you can share the IP address of the host, you can also have a, a virtual network, so you can have a virtual IP address, you can also have, I think, a DHCP mode. Okay. Uh, I think you have, you have I mean, you, can, you have different possible configurations for your, your uh, container, and you have to specify it in, uh, I think, the Docker Compose file. So I think, I guess, maybe you can also have some option to set up uh, this in Docker. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Docker actually uh, starts a Linux 
the mm -hmm. German machine and mm -hmm. put some containers on it. Mm -hmm. So the directory that is given here is inside the virtual machine of the Linux uh, mm -hmm. that Docker created to launch containers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But then is there an option to share to share a folder between your host OS, so to mount a folder yeah. from your host but OS? but you do it the other way. So you, uh, when you create the container, you attach an existing <coughs> directory mm -hmm. that is not possible the other way. Yes, mm -hmm. okay. <coughs> so, <coughs> let's continue, if it works.
further. Um, what if um, you are a uh, sorry, <laughs> an infrastructure provider? So you have a cluster of machines. Uh, you want to share the resources between users. You want to see the resources of all the nodes together. Uh, you want to share the resources between tasks. Uh, and potentially you have a virtualization layer. So you may have many different virtual machines, many containers, many users, many nodes. It's a nightmare. Okay? So this is very tricky part when you're an infrastructure provider. You have to handle all this. And so here you can, you may see where I go, is that you exactly need what you need in an operating system. You need to share resources, but potentially those resources would be virtualized. But you have the same problems. You have to share the resources between users, uh, between tasks, uh, etc. Okay? So actually, um, uh, the infrastructure provider are not doing this manually, and um, we are offering them some operating system specifically made to handle virtualized infrastructure. Uh, so, um, the goal of a virtualized, uh, an operating system for virtualized infrastructure is to orchestrate the different virtual machines, the different containers, the different users, the different nodes, etc. And OpenStack is a typical example of such operating systems. So OpenStack is the open source operating system of the cloud. So OpenStack is responsible for handling um, the different users, uh, the different nodes, uh, the different kind of virtualizations, etc. It's, it's a, like a very huge operating system to handle all this. Okay? So it's distributed. Uh, OpenStack is very modular. Each part of OpenStack is distributed along the, the nodes of your infrastructure and it will handle the virtualization layer, the users, etc. Okay, so the next step is really about cloud computing. Uh, do you have any additional question on this one? such as Muzo.com, uh, eBay, whatever. And what happened is that progressively this uh, website uh, got a very large audience that was uh, continuously uh, growing. And the issue that at the beginning when you had few users, only one observer was enough to sell all the users. The problem is that when the users uh, were more and more, uh, you had to construct infrastructure to uh, be able to respond to the, all the requests. Obviously, what happened is that the website became more and more complex because the customers wanted to provide them some services. 
uh, you had to provide new features, and uh, what happened is the complex stacks behind the web services become more complex. You had to store, you had to have many uh, web servers to uh, serve all the requests, you had to have a database that was scaling to uh, store all the, all the users' information, all the products, etc. Your database had to scale to uh, have a good response time, etc. And as you gradually, uh, those software stacks became more and more complex. And the issue, when a part of your software stack was failing, everything was failing, so you, had, uh, so you were missing some transactions with the customers, and it was a problem. So, progressively, what happened that some actors, some economic actors, started to create some services where you could, for example, uh, uh, outsource, for example, one aspect of your business to another act 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 actors. For example, I don't know, uh, uh, but some uh, companies that were specialized in uh, hosting some uh, website. So this way, uh, when you outsource your website, the hosting of your website to this company, you did not add to handle all these things. You were uh, delegating uh, this, uh, your website to this company. And in exchange, you were agreeing on a service level uh, agreement, uh, saying that uh, I want, okay, I give you, uh, I uh, outsource the hosting of that website, but you have to guarantee, for example, that my website will be uh, up uh, with a uh, uh, service level of, I don't know, it should be available at 99.999% of the time. So really what happened is that some actors have emerged. They were specialized <coughs> in uh, one aspect of the business and uh, gradually, gradually, uh, many actors appeared uh, specializing on one aspect. For example, uh, hosting, a database, uh, advertisement, for example, like people Amazon, uh, Google, etc. And what happened is that as the web was having success, those actors have, uh, have multiplied and uh, you had a very, a very large uh, variety of actors that have uh, emerged. And at, uh, over the course of time, uh, all these offers became to, how to say, to sediment, like trying to uh, uh, become consistent. So you have uh, for one, business, one, one aspect, you have many actors trying to uh, same things, actors were inspired by other actors, and at the end, what you have is that you have a kind of uh, uh, homogeneity in the, in, the, in the offering. And after a few years, what happened is that uh, this uh, offering was sediment, and it was that we were able to see uh, different strats of services, and it led to, uh, to, uh, to some uh, classification of the services offered in. Uh, in, in, uh, in the outsourcing of uh, web services and it leads to somehow to the current classification of cloud computing. So what happened uh, during all these uh, 10 years or 15 years of, uh, of actor computing in the, to, 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 uh, to host or to propose some services in, in, uh, in, uh, in the context of web services, what happened is that somehow you, we found that there was a kind of classification uh, between the actors. And I will show you now, uh, I will tell one of the classifications that is very famous, which is the classification between infrastructure, platform, and application. So it will be clear, clear maybe in a few uh, minutes. Uh, so here in this picture, what you can see that we have a kind of pyramid with different levels, three levels, and here we have different actors. So it's a bit blur because uh, it's a project that we do quality. We see that there are different uh, actors, for example, Amazon EC2, Google Cloud Platform, uh, we have on top here uh, Google App Engine, Heroku, we have Gmail, and YouTube. So it corresponds to the, major, to the diversity of actors you can find when you, have, uh, when, when you consider web services. So we have five applications where you just create an account, but you also have some people pro providing uh, some uh, environments, and you have also some people providing some, uh, some, uh, some uh, computing resources. So uh, what uh, Youssef did in 2010 is that she uh, uh, created <coughs> um, a classification of all the services here in three layers. So we start with the low level layer, so it's infrastructure as a service. And in this layer, what happens is that you have a provider. So we, for each layer, we consider always the provider and the customers. So in infrastructure as a service, what happens is that you have a provider that has a lot of servers. And what this provider does is that it will abstract all those servers 
by uh, virtualizing, virtualizing uh, them with virtual machines, with containers, usually it's often virtual machines. And what the customers of uh, infrastructure service uh, providers uh, pay for, they pay for computing resources. So basically, if you use Amazon EC2, uh, you, will, uh, you will rent a virtual machine to Amazon, and uh, Amazon will provide you access to, uh, to, to a virtual machine that has uh, some amount of uh, virtual CPUs, some amount of uh, RAM, of memory, uh, some storage, some, uh, also some networking, uh, uh, some network networking capabilities, and this virtual machine will also be located in a place. So all these aspects in fact runs inside servers in the big data centers which are very complex. But what does the, uh, the infrastructure as a service provider does? That it abstracts all those aspects and simplify everything to the user. So at the end you don't have to run the server by yourself, you don't have to plug the, or the cable to, uh, to, uh, to find a free uh, uh, internet service provider to uh, have a full tolerance. All these aspects are uh, managed by the infrastructure as a service uh, provider and somehow you outsource uh, some part of your infrastructure to this provider and simplify uh, your, your, your life. Um, and also um, this model is, is uh, very close to the utility computing model that you mentioned at the first presentation in the way that if in fact what you do is that you uh, create a VM, if you need more you create a second VM and when you don't need etc uh, etc et until you uh, can cope with all the user's requests. If you don't need a VM at one point, you destroy it. It's, uh, it's okay, you pay <coughs> for what you want to do. This is the first layer, posture service, the so low level layer. Is it clear for everybody here? So now, on top of this layer, you have the platform as a service layer. And in this uh, layer, what the provider does is that it provides um, um, a development environment to uh, the customers. So what I mean by development environment is a, a configured environment with some software, sometimes very complex software, uh, and, in, uh, and what the customer gets, gets uh, somehow a turnkey uh, environment. For example, you can get uh, you know, uh, uh, an environment to develop some Java applications. So you get, for example, Java with a database, somehow configured, uh, uh, configured by the provider. And the provider, in this case, under all the software complexity of the, of the development environment. For example, if you have, uh, I will talk about database because this is what I uh, find uh, more um, interesting, that somehow if your application needs a database, what the platform service uh, provider will do is that it will configure the database so that it will be optimal in its performance. So, for example, it will find the good parameters to tune and to uh, make it more uh, uh, reactive. You will also under, for example, the high availability mode. If you want, for example, uh, to have no interruption service in case of uh, one server or one virtual machine that uh, runs via, uh, uh, beyond the platform as service uh, level, uh, the platform as service provider will have, for example, several uh, VM running here and we will uh, configure the database uh, provided in the uh, platform, uh, in the development environment, so that if one of the VM, for example, fails, the user will take the, uh, will continue to work and will uh, get the request. You will also handle all the backups, which are very important. It's an aspect that is uh, post or sometimes forgotten, but the platform as service uh, provider will handle this. And also, you will have some uh, service level agreements. So, that, for example, if your database doesn't have the good performance, you will be able to, uh, to ask the provider to uh, have a phone or something like this. So the provider manages all the complexity of the software stack, and the software stack. So it can be this in the software stack can be very complex sometimes, and the user, the customers, gets some things uh, configured and doesn't have to handle all the complexity here. Is it clear? Yeah. And now on the top of the top, you have the software service level, and in this case, it's very simple. You the, the provider provides a service and manage all the complexity of the service. You manage also all the complexity of the platform and all the complexity of the infrastructure of the service and the customer uh, just access the service. Usually you create an account here, you put your credit card and you can uh, access the service and use it. So for example, when you, uh, I don't know, when you create an account in uh, Gmail, you don't have to uh, create a virtual machine, you don't have to create a database. Google does everything for you. This is the software service. Uh, 
No question? Yeah. And uh, so as you, as, as you saw, there was infrastructure service level, platform as service level, software as service level, and in fact, there is also <coughs> everything as a service. In fact, this is a common model where uh, people consume a service and pay for what they use in the service. So you have some people providing a uh, network as a service, function as a service. Uh, you also have transport as a service. For example, Uber is a transport as a service. So this everything as a service is very popular in, uh, in the world. Now I will go to it. Uh, yeah.
you just want a continuity of service, but you don't care about the performance. Um, also, one very important difference with HPC is the economic model behind cloud computing. In the cloud, you are going to pay what you consume. So it's really a service you pay for something like you pay for renting a car in Madrid. Um, in, the, in the HPC, you do not pay. It's not a public uh, infrastructure. It's a private infrastructure, most of the time uh, reserved to scientists. Uh, while cloud computing is, you have cloud public cloud computing which is open to anyone, like Amazon, AWS. You also have some private cloud, but I mean, the idea is that you pay for a service and you get some, some computing resources. Um, of course, as a cloud provider, you do not want to lose money, so you want to use uh, the computers. Um, as much as possible. That's why virtualization is very important in the cloud because you are going to put VMs on the same node to optimize the use of the resource and to not lose money. Um, yeah. And so uh, the counterpart is that you have high overheads. So it's difficult to, to get the best possible performance in the cloud even if there are more and more HPC virtual machines available on the cloud providers. Still, you have some virtualization, so you will not have the best possible performance. Okay? So, this was the path to cloud computing. The path to HPC is much simpler. In HPC, well, you have the operating system evolution. You need multi-node, multi-tasking, multi-user. And you got the host OS. That's it. No virtualization. And then you have some job scheduler uh, APIs in order to ask for resources. But it's very low level. It's like command line. And, you know, it's it's not like clicking uh, on virtual box. Okay. Um, and you have the evolution of the resources. But actually, HPC is only about cluster. You don't have inter-site communication. In HPC infrastructure, you have one cluster with very high bandwidth network between the nodes, and you are going to get the best possible performance from this cluster of machine. And that's HPC. Okay? Um, of course, there is a trendy research domain, which is the convergence of HPC and cloud. Um, so the idea again is to get uh, the advantages from the two worlds. So from HPC, well, uh, they are aware that the tools in HPC infrastructure are not very user friendly. Uh, you have a batch scheduler, you ask for resources, it's very low level. And most of the time scientists don't know anything about low level details of computers, so using batch scheduler for a physicist is very difficult. And so, in time, they are losing users because they turn to the cloud, which is much more user-friendly, even if you don't have the best possible performance. Um, so that's why more and more in HPC infrastructure, you have containers. Uh, um, people from HPC are turning to containers to get more flexible tools and to get more user-friendly approach of um, application packaging, etc. From the cloud viewpoint, it's the opposite. The cloud providers realize that there is really a market about HPC. Uh, and they realize that they can win more money <coughs> from it. So, they have uh, started to uh, offer some HPC resources, which is, for instance, uh, GPUs, so graphical processing units and very powerful CPUs with uh, more than uh, 64 cores at the same time, which is the kind of infrastructure that we have in HPC, not in the cloud. So they offer specific kind of virtual machines, which are lighter, and that run on uh, HPC resources. And uh, also, they realize that if they want to offer um, a service level agreement close to HPC, they also have to 
consolidate less because you have interferences between the virtual machines. Okay. So that's it it's about HPC. Maybe also you will have heard about grid computing. Um, so grid computing appeared in 1999 with the work of Jan Foster and Steve Drake. And uh, it's somewhere in between HPC and cloud. So the idea is that uh, the hardware is more heterogeneous than in an HPC infrastructure. So you do not have only one cluster, but maybe more than one, with inter-site communications. Uh, you, you have some kind of consolidation, but without virtualization. So you can have multiple jobs on the same node. Uh, and so, the, it looks like this, actually. You have exactly the same evolution that HPC, except that you have the inter-site communication. You have multiple clusters. You do not have virtualization, but you have some kind of consolidation in order to optimize the usage of the nodes. And you get the grid computing. This is more or less the, the difference with the problem. Uh, okay, and now, what is fog and edge computing? So this is a domain uh, we are working on on the stack research team. So there are some drawbacks, uh, there are many drawbacks in the cloud computing paradigm. The main one is that it is a centralized paradigm. So you have very huge data centers in a given place and you run some virtual machines in this space. So you have latency issues, for instance. If you want, uh, I don't know, you have an autonomous car, uh, you have sensors, so you, you feel uh, the world around you, and you want to start a computation to analyze the situation. You will have to send the, the data to the data center in the cloud. Maybe the data center is in, is in the USA. So you will wait for the data to reach the USA. You will start a computation. When the computation is done, your data will go back from the USA. And you have a latency that is not acceptable for autonomous car because you need to answer in a few microseconds while the latency to get data from the USA is more about uh, milliseconds or seconds. So there is a latency issue. There is also a security issue, uh, mostly uh, legislative. I don't know if they say that in, in English, but um, the problem is that the law that is applied on your data is the law of the country that hosts the data. So um, many companies do not want to use the cloud because of that, because the law on on the data privacy is very different according to the country, and so it's very sensitive yeah. <laughs> for the company. And another problem is the fault tolerance. Uh, you have uh, many single points of failure in the centralized cloud paradigm. So you can read this uh, very often in the news that uh, Amazon got a problem and some companies uh, lost, I don't know how, million euros because the services were not available for two days. So, uh, this is the kind of problem that are correlated to the fact that the cloud paradigm is centralized. So, you have everything at, in the same place, uh, potentially far away from you, and so you have latency problems, code variants, and security issues. So the idea of fog and edge computing is that, okay, between me, the user, and the, the cloud uh, data center, there are the network, there is the network. And the network is very connected, uh, it's, a, it's a very connected graph. And if I put some small resources within the network, so in the path between me and the data center, Maybe I would be able to do some computation closer to me. Instead of being uh, in the USA, maybe the computation could be uh, in Madrid. Or maybe if I need more storage, maybe there is a bigger uh, data center in Barcelona. 
but I do not need to go to the USA. So the idea of Fog and Ash is to use <coughs> network infrastructure to distribute some computational resources which are smaller than cloud computing, but distributed, geographically distributed. And so you, you get um, your computing results uh, very fast. You can apply the law of the local country, and you will not have single point of failure because the network is highly connected. Okay. So this is the basic idea of uh, fog and edge computing. So the fog is more about the core network, and the edge is more about uh, small devices. Like, I need a very small computation, but to get the results very fast, well, maybe there is a Raspberry Pi in the... <laughs> In the projector, I, I don't think so. But <laughs> uh, and so instead of, uh, of uploading my, my data to a data center, I will use the Raspberry of, of uh, the local device. Okay. Um, so fog and edge computing is a very trendy topic. Um, actually, most cloud providers already. Um, divide their data centers into regions, uh, mainly because of the law problem. So, for instance, in Amazon, I think there are um, 200 regions or something like that. Um, so, it's already kind of distributed. Um, also, of course, telecom companies are very interested in fog and edge computing because they handle the core network, like Orange. They have the core network. So if they put resources in the core network, they will be able to rent the core network for computation, which is an additional uh, uh, payment for them. You see? They have new clients and it, it's good for them. Um, and another point is that fog and edge computing are enabling technologies for 5G because in 5G, so I'm not an expert in network, but the idea of 5G is that uh, you, have, uh, you need to do some signal computation very fast, close to the antennas of the 5G. Um, so one solution is to put uh, computing resources at, at each antenna. But this is very costly because you have to imagine the worst case and provide the worst case in computer resources, which costs a lot. And when your load on your network is very low, you're not using the resources you're paying. So the idea is to virtualize uh, network functions in the 5G and to consume only what is needed according to the load of the network. So fog and edge computing is an answer to this because you will have some computing resources and <coughs> rent close to the antennas. You see? More or less. Yeah. Okay. So in the team we are working uh, on fog and edge computing. Uh, in particular, we are addressing the question how to operate uh, large and massively geo-distributed infrastructures such as fog and edge computing. So it is like a decentralized operating system. Okay? We've seen that the operating system could be distributed. It means I have a part of my operating system on a node, another part on another node, etc. But when you build a decentralized operating system, it's another level. It's a level where you don't want to have an entity that is responsible for knowing everything in your infrastructure. So you will have some part of the information at some point and you have to uh, orchestrate all this decentralized operating system. So it talks about peer-to-peer -peer algorithms and things like that. Uh, that's it. Yeah. Okay, so we have the last part. So we talked about a bit about uh, 
the cloud computing, the utility computing, the IT growth, and the sustainability of all this. So it's more a philosophic opening <laughs> to, <laughs> to this course. Okay, so you've seen in the, in the training that uh, computer resources have evolved through time to get more and more power, uh, more and more computation. Uh, actually, what happens is that uh, uh, IT resources has followed for a long time the Moore's law, uh, which is a law saying that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit double about every two years. So it means that every two years the, the computation power of your computer double. And this was true. I can see it. So from a long time ago. Uh, to approximately 2013, where we encountered some uh, physical limitations uh, because we, the transistors are so small that we have quantum effects between them. And uh, there are so many transistors that we are not able to, to cool the chips. So the heat is too high. So it's really a physical limitation. We, we were able to overpass this limitation by using the multi-core uh, uh, technology. So instead of having a chip with more and more transistors, we just put another chip. <laughs> and another and another. And now we have many core infrastructures and GPUs that are using this kind of uh, technologies. But the, so you, this is a video, if you are interested, you will look at it. The point is that even more itself, so the man who created the, the law, the Moore's law, he says exponential never lasts. We will have at some point some physical limitations. It's not possible that the, the computing power uh, increase forever. And so the question is when will it end? We thought it would end in 2013, but it was not the case because of new discoveries about uh, multiple core architectures. But probably it would end at, at some point. So this is another video of a, a, a very interesting researcher who's talking about the end of the Moore's law and what, what's next. So some people are talking about quantum com computing. I don't know anything about that in computing, but so probably it's very interesting. Um, but the point is that, so okay, maybe we have to think a bit about what we really need in the future. Uh, so this is um, the result of uh, the study of a project, which is called the SHIFT project. Uh, the SHIFT project is uh, interested in uh, all the energy, energetic issues. Uh, particularly uh, related to climate change. Um, <clears throat> so what you can see here, well, what says the report is that uh, since 2013, IT represents from 2.5 to 3.7 of the global CO2 emissions. So when you're using Gmail on your mobile, it costs a lot to the climate, <coughs> to the Earth, and people are not aware of it. So the SHIFT project, the goal of the SHIFT project is to explain this and to think, let's think about what we could do about this. Um, so here you can see uh, this blue line was the expected growth of IT in 2015. In 2018, it was um, this was the new expecting IT growth. And this is the worst case estimated. And you see it's an exponential. It's not sustainable. So in the shift project, they propose a sobriety computer vision where you try to take into account the energetic and climate problem and try to think of another way of seeing computer science and another way of consuming IT resources. Um, another in very interesting part of the report is that uh, when you buy a, a smartphone, 
it already consumes 80% of its life energetic consumption. So the production of IT resources is very costly in energy. Um, and so the plan is not only about uh, reducing uh, the energy consumption of data centers, it's also do we need all this uh, computer power? Do we need it? And do we need to build all these IT resources and then to uh, throw them in the nature because we do not need them anymore and buy new ones? So this is the main purpose of the separately scenario of the ship project is to reconsider the life cycle of these IT resources and try to less consume them and to reuse them, to repacking them, etc. Okay. <laughs> so uh, yeah, these are the big questions. Uh, do we really need uh, more storage and more computing capacities? Do we, do we really need 5G to watch video streaming in the bus? Uh, do we need so much kittens videos? <laughs> Um, yeah, so this is a kind of, of question as a researcher you need to think about uh, your, uh, when you will give some teachings, when you will talk to people about your activities, you have to have in mind the cost of the IT in the climate change. It's not neg negligible, so be aware of it, think about it. I think it's uh, very important. And. Uh, it's also part of a researcher job to, uh, to think about his own domain, how it impacts the, the world. So, for instance, uh, fog and edge computing. This is a real question. Uh, okay, maybe we need it for very specific cases that we want to, to defend, but maybe uh, fog and edge computing, <coughs> watch uh, kitchen videos, it's not very useful. So. What is the goal of all this? Okay. This is a message I wanted to share. And sorry, but I don't know. That is not for me. Yeah, to illustrate this point on sustainability with some software. Uh, I think that you all know about Bitcoin and everybody's speaking about Bitcoin and the fact that it's uh, revolutioning the, the world, etc. Uh, some researchers have uh, taken a look to the impact of Bitcoin over energy consumption and uh, some studies are very interesting. For example, uh, some studies have uh, compared the transaction uh, per second that is possible to do with Bitcoin. So I think in 2017 it was about uh, 4.6 transactions per second uh, with Bitcoins. But if you take a look to the transaction uh, per second that you can do with the Visa network, for example, it's about uh, so, uh, is a risk factor of 300. That means that today Bitcoin has less performance in, uh, than the Visa, for example, uh, network. So it means that if you want to, to use uh, Bitcoin as a, a way to uh, relay transaction uh, for your daily payment, it means that you have to increase somehow the computing power to, uh, to in a way that uh, you can uh, uh, Multiply by uh, 300 the number of transactions you do. But if some, uh, meanwhile, some researchers have taken a look to the uh, energy consumption of Bitcoin and they found out that recently, uh, I think in 2000, uh, maybe 19, I don't recall, um, the total amount of energy consumed by Bitcoin uh, annually is the same as the annual uh, consumption of a country of medium size such as Austria. But you that today to just uh, validate uh, for, from 4.6 transactions per second, you need to consume the same amount of energy as Austria. And the problem with this is that if you want to increase by 300, maybe, uh, the number of transactions you do, it means that maybe you have to multiply by 300 the uh, computing power that you uh, require by Bitcoin. But if you multiply this, this, uh, this uh, consumption by 300, you reach something that is bigger than the two days uh, worldwide power consumption. But pose some how the, the question of the sustainability of the system by Bitcoin. So what we wanted to uh, to illustrate with this example is that somehow when you design a system, when you design software, when you do some some cloud computing infrastructure with a lot of data centers, you have to think uh, 
of the big picture, like uh, you have to take into account a lot of, uh, of, uh, of things. And one of the aspects that have uh, been forgotten for a long time is the center, which is very important, and some people are working on, on it to, uh, to, uh, to solve this, so is, is the energetical aspect of the center. So we wanted to sensibilize uh, you to this uh, problem with this uh, opening <coughs> of the That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you have any question before we move to Madrid uh, <laughs> and drink a beer? <laughs>